The largest animals that inhabit the parts of the oceans most accessible to us are pretty similar in having bodies supported by bones, red blood, two eyes and four limbs. So although many of them have monstrous proportions, we probably wouldn't label them as such. In stark contrast, the largest creatures concealed in the parts of the ocean that are out of reach and difficult to study are truly horrifying. The creatures that have dominion over these spaces having taken a very different evolutionary pathway. At these depths, sunshine, and therefore food, are in short supply, and the weight of the surface water makes for crushing pressures, creating an environment you'd suspect was terrible for producing giant predators. So why do certain animals in the deep grow so much bigger than their surface relatives? The deep sea encompasses more than 95% of the Earth's habitable living space, and although it may not seem like it, contains many ecosystems that are actually quite different from each other. And some of these environments seem to be much better at producing leviathans than others. In between the nothingness, there are certain geological features that allow for small pockets of life-thriving areas like seamounts, hydrothermal vents, and even shipwrecks. The majority of the very famous giant creatures of the deep, like giant and colossal squid, live in what is known as the mesopelagic or twilight zone, which is around a thousand meters below the surface, and deeper than this, very large creatures are much rarer. But the mechanisms of deep sea gigantism are still at work. The ocean is filled with minuscule scavenging crustaceans called amphipods, which are some of the deepest living animals known to exist, being found in the deepest of ocean trenches where in contrast to their tiny surface relatives, certain species can approach the size of rabbits. The effect of deep sea gigantism seems to vary greatly depending on the type of animal as well. When it comes to hard-shelled or squishy animals, there is a clear trend of larger body sizes in the deep sea that affects all sorts of different invertebrates. Most famous would be the giant and colossal squid, and for good reason, as these are the Earth's largest invertebrates. Giant squid, scientifically known as Archaeotuthis, most likely have a global distribution, being found all over the planet, and max out about 12 to 13 meters long. However, in 2007, the largest intact squid and largest invertebrate ever discovered was hauled up by a fishing vessel near New Zealand, uncovering an almost 500 kilogram female colossal squid that stretched out with its tentacles to over 8 meters long. It was eating an Antarctic toothfish, which can grow to be human-sized or larger, and there is a lot of evidence they are regularly hunted or at least consumed by colossal squid. Amazingly, the specimen is the largest intact colossal squid discovered, but substantially larger squid beaks have been found in the stomachs of sperm whales, so the half-ton female is almost certainly not a maximum size they reach. These two giant creatures are also only two of at least a dozen two-meter plus deep-sea squid lurking in the darkness, like the Humboldt squid, clubhook squid, Dana octopus squid, and the creepy magna pinna squid, some of these being considerably more common than giant squid. Many of these large squid aren't closely related to each other either, so they have evolved into giants independently, and nothing like these creatures exists at the surface permanently. Deep sea squid are just an order of magnitude larger than their surface relatives. However, when it comes to vertebrates, the correlation between deeper water and larger body sizes is a lot less clear. For instance, deep sea fish tend to actually be quite small, many of them even having larger relatives at the surface. Despite the menacing appearance of anglerfish, they are usually small, and the largest anglerfish known to exist is actually a surface creature, the monkfish. Monkfish sometimes migrate into deeper water, but are considerably more common in shallower waters, and dwarf their deep sea relatives. Far and away, one of the most diverse and abundant groups of deep sea fish are known as the stomaforms, which contains viperfish, dragonfish, and bristlemouths. These fish are highly specialized to live in the deep, almost all containing bioluminescence and features like transparent knife-like teeth that stop them catching the light, helping to keep them concealed. Yet despite their heavy adaptations to their environment, the largest known member is no more than 30 centimeters long. There are some exceptions though, like the giant oarfish that is the longest known bony fish in the world, growing to around 8 meters long. Although the oarfish is questionable as it is an extremely specialized and unusual filter feeding animal that doesn't have any similar smaller relatives living in shallower water. However, one clear example of vertebrates experience gigantism are sharks, specifically the giant sleeper sharks that are truly enormous, confirmed to surpass 6 meters in length and weigh over a ton. Although rivaling some of the largest surface species of sharks, they are not closely related. Sleeper sharks are squaliforms, informally known as dogfish, which on average are some of the smallest sharks in the ocean. 
Sleeper sharks are scientifically known as somniacids, which are a group of deep sea dogfish, and although the Greenland and Pacific sleeper sharks are the most famous, they are a diverse group of sharks inhabiting many parts of the deep, including the extreme depths, as the Portuguese dogfish can dive to at least 3,700 meters below the surface, being the deepest document shark species in the world. One of the simplest explanations for deep sea gigantism is that the gradient of pressure and darkness creates a barrier to entry for unadapted animals. These natural barriers keep an insular population of animals separate that are able to evolve independently. There are many reasons to believe that invertebrates are more adaptable to the extreme conditions in the deep than vertebrates, and animals will tend to evolve to get larger if there is no competition and enough resources available to do so. And so creatures like giant and colossal squid may have just evolved into the larger creatures in these ecosystems, and then once they are filling the niche, it is actually very unlikely that another animal would outcompete them outside of a big environmental shock. The deep sea has a very limited availability of food due to a lack of primary producers like plants, and in fact barring a few select habitats, high food scarcity is one of the defining features of deep sea ecosystems. And given this, evolving to get larger seems like a terrible evolutionary strategy. But actually, there are reasons that gigantism could be beneficial. Smaller animals often have higher metabolic rates per unit of body mass, meaning they expand more energy to stay active. And larger animals actually often have more efficient metabolisms. Larger animals can also store more energy, and so can go longer without eating and travel longer distances in search for food and to find a mate, making it more likely they will reproduce. The food scarcity and isolation have led some researchers to argue that the deep sea may share characteristics with island ecosystems, where colonial animals from the mainland can evolve to grow or shrink to match the availability of food or amount of predators in their new environment. In an already challenging environment of study, examining fast-moving large deep-sea predators like giant squid is extremely difficult. Because of this, most research on deep-sea gigantism, or most empirical things that are understood about the deep-sea in general, have come from studies done on animals like deep-sea snails and crustaceans. In 2006, gastropods, which are snails, slugs, and their relatives, were studied at different positions in the water column, from the shallows well into the deep. It was found that the smaller bodied shallow water gastropod species had significantly larger deep sea representatives, while the opposite is true for gastropod species that are large bodied in shallow water. So there is some data that seems to show that the deep sea functions in a similar way to island ecosystems. But there are some key differences. Both habitats are defined by food scarcity, but in a different way. Islands are limited by the amount of plants that can grow on a limited amount of land. But deep sea ecosystems just have a low amount of resources available per cubic meter. Furthermore, there is some evidence that at least some creatures may have a much lower risk of getting eaten in the deep, but generally, predator prey relationships in the deep sea are poorly understood, and it isn't actually known if animals like deep sea snails are at a lower risk of being hunted by predators than their shallow water relatives. Another explanation is that the colder temperatures of the deep may be at least partly responsible for giant creatures. In the Antarctic and Antarctic seas, the water temperature is so low already, it doesn't actually change very much in deeper water. And the shallower waters in this part of the world are home to giant invertebrates reminiscent of a deep sea ecosystem, containing large sea slugs, sponges, and worms. This seems to be especially true of crustaceans, with there being giant cold water crabs found in both shallow and deep water, but also another group of arthropods called sea spiders. Sea spiders are extremely common, with over a thousand species being known across all of the world's oceans, and in most ecosystems these creatures are quite small, being comparable to normal spiders. However, down in the depths they can grow into giants. There is one family known as the Colossendiidae that has species that can grow to the size of cats. They stalk the bottom of the sea in search for their soft-bodied prey, where they will then use their proboscis like a straw to suck their insides out. This family of unusually big spiders can also be found in shallower waters in the Arctic and Antarctica, where there are species almost as large as their deep sea relatives. There is a trend in biology known as Bergman's Rule, where the average body size of animals is larger on average in colder climates, and due to the large sizes of some Arctic and Antarctic invertebrates, this does seem to be true, at least in these environments. The classic explanation for why colder environments tend to have more large creatures is that their bodies are better at retaining heat. Larger objects have a proportionately smaller surface area compared to volume, meaning their bodies make less contact with the environment, so they radiate less heat per unit of mass. This explanation could affect any type of animal, but invertebrates have certain key differences with their biology that means the cold may have more of an impact on them. 
As invertebrates are cold-blooded, the speed of their metabolism is dictated by body temperature, and so a colder body means slower metabolism, which can delay sexual maturity, increase lifespan, and in the case of many invertebrates like crustaceans, increase their maximum size. So the vastness and difficulty to access their environments means that the evolution of deep sea creatures and why they reach such large proportions is still not very well understood. However, the mystery surrounding these elusive and often enormous predators is why we find these environments so compelling in the first place, and more study may not just improve our understanding of their evolution, but also will inevitably uncover more amazing creatures as well. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.